Well, I think we'll get started. Um, I'm uh, Manjo Gill from the Department of Ophthalmology at Feinberg School of Medicine. And on behalf of the Medical Faculty Council, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the IFAM Clinical Lecture Series. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two world-renowned experts in their respective fields of retina and neurocognitive disease, who together will be delivering today's lecture entitled Detecting Pre-Symptomatic Alzheimer's Disease, What We Have Learned from Retinal Imaging. This, high, uh, this lecture really highlights the cross-collaboration between multiple disciplines in the Feinberg School of Medicine to advance the care of our patients. Dr. Sandra Weintraub will be presenting first. She's a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences in the Department of Neurology and Psychology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She's both a distinguished researcher and clinician and is the associate director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is part of the Messalem Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease, which is funded by the National Institutes of Aging. Her main research interests lie in the study of dementia and cognitive aging, where she's authored over 300 publications. She's received multiple honors and currently serves on a national advisory committee designed to standardize data collection for Alzheimer's disease across the country. She will then be followed by my colleague from the Department of Ophthalmology, Dr. Amani Fauzi. Dr. Fauzi is a prominent vitreoretinal surgeon and clinician clinician scientist holding the Cyrus Tang and Lee Jampol endowed professorship at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Fauzi runs an NIH funded lab studying ischemic retinopathies and also has clinical research focus on novel retinal imaging modalities. As a world expert on imaging, she serves on multiple editorial boards, including Nature, and has authored hundreds of peer reviewed articles. She's received multiple awards, most recently the Young Investigator Award of the Macula Society, which I know she's very proud of. We thank you both for accepting our invitation to present today, and we really look forward to hearing about your exciting collaboration in the field of neurodegenerative disease. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so both Dr. Weintraub and Dr. Fauzi will give their presentations, and then afterwards uh, there will be time for um, questions and answers. If you could simply just uh, type in your question at the bottom, um, uh, there should be a Q&A box and, um, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. All right, thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Weintraub. Thank you very much. It's a really great pleasure to have been invited to do this presentation with my colleague, uh, Dr. Fozzi. I'm trying to move my slides, <laughs> sorry. Next slide, please. Okay, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about our center um, because we're very much into collaborating throughout Northwestern. Dr. Fozzi is one of my many collaborators and uh, what we try to do is to reach out to the community doing research in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease to try to do innovative things that haven't been tried before and maybe lead the field forward. Um, the Mesulum Center has several components, our NIA designated Alzheimer's Disease Center. The Clinical Core Registry, I am in charge of that, and that is a registry of over 500 people who are cognitively normal or have mild cognitive impairment or have early stage dementia. And the whole uh, idea behind the registry is to have people participate in studies of Alzheimer's disease and aging. We have clinical services at Northwestern Medicine. We have multidisciplinary training programs. We have basic and clinical research labs that look at the molecular and cellular basis of neurodegenerative brain diseases that cause dementia. And we also offer uh, pharmacologic trials as well as non-pharmacologic interventions. As you will see, Alzheimer's and related disorders, uh, we really don't have a cure for them. We don't have treatment that stops them or makes them go away. So, uh, and especially now that people are being diagnosed earlier and earlier, there's a long period of time where uh, you need to plan, you need support. And so we have a lot of these non-pharmacologic interventions for patients and their carers. 
I also just wanted to put a plug in for our 26th annual Alzheimer Day. Uh, unfortunately, this year it's going to be virtual, but this was from last year where we have more than 400 people attend posters. Uh, this is actually on the third floor of Feinberg, but this year it will all be virtual and much shorter. So um, if you're interested, uh, please sign up. So I'm going to start off uh, by talking about what Alzheimer's disease is and the importance of early detection uh, and biomarkers in pre-symptomatic AD. I don't know how many people are familiar with that terminology of pre-symptomatic AD. And then I will turn the floor over to Amani, who will talk about retinal imaging as a potential non-invasive biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. So what is Alzheimer's disease? It's a neurodegenerative disease of the brain that is characterized by two key protein abnormalities, A-beta amyloid, which we also call uh, senile neuritic plaques, and hyperphosphorylated tau tangles. These two images here on a micrograph showing the uh, postmortem brain tissue examination of somebody who during their lifetime suffered a dementia and it was due to, this is how Alzheimer's disease is defined. The impact of these changes is to destroy healthy brain cells. And so they can no longer function normally, which is what causes the cognitive impairment. It's interesting that in normal aging, these proteinopathies increase. So as we, everybody over the age of 65 who's watching this presentation, is currently manufacturing these things in their brain as they talk. However, it's the density, the number, the place where it hits the brain that will determine whether or not you will show symptoms of cognitive decline and dementia. Alzheimer's disease as a proteinopathy is the most common cause of dementia over the age of 65. So what is dementia? Dementia is a clinical syndrome. It's not a disease of itself and it is characterized by these features. The onset is insidious. You don't, you don't wake up one morning with dementia. The symptoms are slowly progressive, and the symptoms can really, we, we always think of memory loss, but the symptoms really con consist of anything that your brain does. Memory, thinking, thinking of words, executive functions, visual perception, social skills, personality, um, and the difference between dementia symptoms and what we would consider normal cognitive aging is that they interfere with your ability to be independent. And if there are changes in personality and behavior, they interfere with social relationships. So that's kind of the division line between something like mild cognitive impairment, where you might have some cognitive problems, but you're still able to function independently. And dementia can be caused by many, many different entities. This is a highly simplistic uh, cartoon of the things that your brain does. And these, these uh, functions don't live in these areas, but they are, uh, they are mediated by widespread networks. So there's a network that comes into play when you're talking, like I'm talking. There's a network that comes into play when you try to back your car into a space, and that's kind of the spatial um, attention network back here in the parietal occipital area. Uh, there's a, an area deep in the temporal lobe, which is sort of the ongoing tape recorder of what's happening in the course of the day, so that tomorrow you can think back to today, to what did you do today? Dementia diseases, can attack any one of these areas. And for reasons we don't understand, they are highly selective for different regions. So in some disorders, memory is the first thing to go, but in others, somebody may not have any memory loss at all, but just have trouble thinking of words. When you go under the microscope, we have absolutely no problem distinguishing Alzheimer's disease, which is in the lower left, from some of the other neurodegenerative diseases that also cause a dementia syndrome. The top three panels show you uh, three forms of what we call frontotemporal lobar degeneration. And these things have really, uh, it's only been recently that we have discovered these entities. Uh, we've known about Alzheimer's for a very long time, but it's only been in the past 10 or 15 years that these other things have come to light. So we have TDP43 proteinopathy, we have tauopathy, Pick's disease, 
We have fused in sarcoma inclusions, the different type of proteinopathy, and cortical Lewy body disease. So the arrows are pointing to the important features in these diseases. And I just put in a picture of normal brain tissue just to show you that when we get to the microscope, we have no problem. We can tell Alzheimer's from anything else. The problem is when the patient comes into the clinic. So why do we need biomarkers? Well, for a number of reasons, because not all dementia is caused by Alzheimer's disease and not all Alzheimer's disease will present in the same way. So we are not here talking about strep throat. You've got a sore throat, you have some white spots, you have a fever, you do a swab, you have a pathogen, done. But when it comes to dementia, unfortunately, we have a big conundrum. And that is because an early symptom of dementia, again, can be caused by any neurodegenerative disease, although I'm gonna show you that there are different probabilities of association. And a single disease like Alzheimer's can cause any type of early symptom. Most often, however, and again, for reasons we really don't understand, Alzheimer's disease pathology likes to start in the medial temporal lobe. And that's why retentive memory loss, not remembering what happened even 10 minutes ago, uh, is a frequent symptom of the dementia that causes, uh, Alzheimer's disease that causes dementia. So I always love to show this slide because um, I've, I've spent a lot of my career trying to help researchers, patients, clinicians grapple with all the terminology surrounding dementia. And I think this is going to really convince you that we need biomarkers. So in this top level here, we have the presenting symptom. This is what we see as clinicians. This is what is bothering somebody when they come to see us. So you can have an aphasia, behavioral changes, visuospatial changes, or memory loss or amnesia. We also have clinical syndrome labels that we have attached to each of these uh, entities, primary progressive aphasia, behavioral variant, frontotemporal dementia, and so on. Let me draw your attention now to the bottom. And the bottom are the diseases that are causing these syndromes. And what you see is there is no one-to-one -one road from the disease to the syndrome. Instead, there are many arrows from the same disease, but some are thicker than others. So that means that some diseases have more of a tendency to attack a part of the brain, for example, that causes language loss as opposed to memory loss. And one of, uh, an example of that kind of disease might be TDP43 or Pick's disease. However, I'm going to show you that each of these diseases can cause any kind of a dementia syndrome. So it's not, it's not really, uh, there's no hope or no localization, but it's complicated. So let's take the most common form of dementia, which is forgetfulness. The early symptoms are rapid forgetting, poor learning, can't recognize, and they also may have behavioral changes um, such as apathy. And of course, as all of these diseases progress, there are more and more and more symptoms as more of the brain gets invaded by the pathology. Now, if we do an MRI scan, this is a coronal section taken from the brain of an individual who had this form of dementia during life. You can see that, um, trying to find my little arrow here, this is the area where the hippocampus would be. And these big black regions represent atrophy, that the hippocampus is atrophied. There's atrophy all over the rest of the brain, but the hippocampal atrophy is really what is highly correlated with memory loss. What happens when we get to neuropathology? Well, 80% um, have Alzheimer's, and that's why it's called dementia of the Alzheimer type, because 80% of the time when you have this kind of a clinical presentation, you're gonna be right at guessing Alzheimer's, but 20% you're not gonna be. Let's go to a different form of dementia, which is called comportmental dementia or behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. And in this case, memory is fine. They don't, they don't forget what happened yesterday. They just have poor judgment, get easily scammed, social disinhibition. Later on, there are other deficits, but it's the early symptoms that really are most closely linked to what we see in the imaging, in the structural imaging. So here you see, again, a coronal section. The hippocampus is not showing atrophy, but 
you've got huge atrophy in the anterior and uh, temporal and frontal lobes. 80% of those people will have some form of frontotemporal lobar degeneration, but 20% could also have Alzheimer's or something else. Another syndrome, that one that we've made very famous here at Northwestern, Dr. Mesilum uh, first defined primary progressive aphasia. This is a syndrome in which you lose your words. So you're talking, you can't think of a word for something, or you have trouble understanding words that others are saying. And it's not because you can't hear, it's that the language part of the brain, which is illustrated here on the uh, left side showing atrophy in the left hemisphere of the brain, this is how focal these diseases are. Um, in the series that we have studied over time, we see the atrophy starting on the left side. And for many years, it can just stay confined to the left before it moves to the right and the disease invades more areas of the brain. So this focality is another thing that we're really very interested in trying to understand. But anyhow, when these people come to post-mortem um, autopsy, 30 to 40% have plaques and tangles in their brain albeit in a funny distribution. So the plaques and tangles tend to be more concentrated in the language network parts of the brain than in the memory parts of the brain. 60 to 70% will have some form of frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Um, and uh, the last syndrome, which is the visuospatial dementia, now this one is interesting. When I see patients with this particular form of dementia, they usually have been to the ophthalmologist several times to have their prescriptions changed, which doesn't do anything because it's not an acuity issue. It's a perceptual issue. So they have visual perceptual disorders known as simultanagnosia, hemispatial neglect, Balint syndrome, and uh, studies of individuals with this syndrome have led to pictures like this, where you see a SPECT scan showing hypometabolism in the posterior parietal occipital area. This is the front of the brain, this is the back of the brain, and this is uh, the right side of the brain. When those patients come to postmortem study, 70% will have plaques and tangles, 30% will have something else, very often Lewy body, cortical Lewy body disease. Um, some will have cortical basal degeneration pathology, and some will have fatal familial insomnia, although that syndrome is a much more rapidly progressive dementia. So we can kind of be thinking about that because of the time course, which is not like the rest of the dementias, which are much slower. So we need biomarkers, and uh, Northwestern is part of a worldwide multi-center study called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. This has been going on for about 15 years now. It's an observational study where people are enrolled who are either cognitively normal, have mild impairment, or have uh, early signs of dementia. And they're followed. And ADNI uh, does a lot of different modalities so that we can characterize what happens to someone when they come into the study as normal, those who continue to be normal, those who progress over time. And the study is taking a long time because these changes are slow and they take that amount of time to happen. So ADNI collects a structural MRI, ADNI collects uh, FDG PET to look for hypometabolism in Alzheimer dementia. We know very characteristically bilateral parietal temporal uh, hypometabolism is very common. Um, we could net collect information about white matter changes, genetics, demographics. Um, the two newer comers in, in this scene have been uh, amyloid PET scans and cerebrospinal fluid tests to be able to de detect amyloid and tau. And as you're probably thinking, who wants to have a lumbar puncture um, to be told that they have Alzheimer's disease? That would, it would be, I mean, it, it, we, we use it clinically now. It's been a godsend now. Because if you get someone and you're not, and especially someone who has an onset in their 50s, you're not sure what's causing their cognitive decline, it's really good to have this. Amyloid PET scan is, uh, uses an um, amyloid tracer to show regions of uptake. This is taken from the brain of someone who has a dementia. You can see the red areas show a lot of amyloid in this brain. So those have been very helpful and have been 
the biomarkers we have now, they're invasive, they're expensive, they're not broadly available, and we have no biomarkers for the other causes of dementia. This is what we've learned from ADNI, and if you understand this, you will uh, appreciate the need for biomarkers. So what we have along the bottom, the x-axis, is a trajectory starting from what we're calling now pre-symptomatic, and we only know it's pre-symptomatic because we followed these people and saw what happened at the end. And there seems to be a very slow progression from being pre-symptomatic to having early mild cognitive impairment to later mild cognitive impairment to a stage of dementia. Each of these lines is a different marker that is collected in the ADNI study. And if I point your direction, uh, your attention here to this dementia area, you can see that all of the markers, FDG PET, hippocampal atrophy, cerebrospinal uh, A-beta, uh, amyloid imaging, cognitive scores, function, cerebrospinal tau, everything's abnormal. But what's really interesting is if you go back to this period of time here, these are people who are absolutely 100% cognitively normal functioning people out in the community. And what do you see? There is this incredible increase in CSF A-beta and in amyloid PET imaging in those who subsequently go on to develop the dementia. So this is what we have learned from ADNI. And in the past, all of our treatment efforts for Alzheimer's disease have been focused on this stage. And I think that it's not too hard to understand that by the time you get here, the horse is out of the barn. So you've got so much pathology, so much damage that has already been done that there are no neurons left to rescue. And so as a result, none of these trials have really worked. Uh, they've been very discouraging, both to us as researchers and clinicians in the field, but more importantly to our patients who are living with this. Now, the focus is on this piece of the um, graph. So what we're trying to do is to intervene at a point in time when we might be able to prevent the accumulation of amyloid and then the cascade of other abnormalities that unfold in people who are positive for amyloid, but who are not yet showing the cognitive symptoms. There is a huge trial ongoing now called the A4 trial, where uh, Northwestern is one of, again, this is a worldwide study, multi-center, because we need thousands and thousands of people and lots and lots of years, anti-amyloid treatment for asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease, where people are entered into the trial who are positive for amyloid PET, and then they are followed with monthly infusions of an anti-amyloid drug, the one that's being used in this particular trial is solanezumab. And um, some are getting placebo. And so you can imagine the dedication of people who are coming from monthly infusions, not knowing if they're getting the treatment or the placebo uh, for years. The study is now, I believe, going into its seventh year. Uh, we, have not, we don't know the results yet. The double blind has not been broken. But what we do know is that people at baseline who have elevated amyloid, even though their scores are normal cognitively, they are not as high as scores of people who have not elevated amyloid. So even when you're normal, you're less normal than normal. One bit of good news is that uh, we are now uh, in an era where we may even be able to imagine having plasma-based biomarkers. And these are, uh, there are two kinds of biomarkers that have been identified. One is plasma neurofilament light chain, and the other one is biomarkers for A-beta 42 over 40. These are different molecular forms of A-beta. And um, I'm glad to say that our center is planning on uh, collaborating. Uh, Bob Vassar, who is the PI of our NIA grant, will be um, collaborating with Kai Blenow and Randy Bateman to see if we can 
get these biomarkers in our own lab because we really haven't had a lot of luck getting people to agree to a research cerebrospinal fluid test to get biomarkers. So we're very hopeful that this is kind of going to be the next wave. But Amani and I got together. Um, Amani, do you remember, did I call you first or did you call me first? <laughs> okay. So we want to know if it's in the eyes because there were some early reports of retinal changes and you know that the retina is an extension of the brain uh, where wouldn't it be nice if we could just look in somebody's eyes and find a biomarker that would be predictive and so we wouldn't have to hurt anyone and they would also get an eye examination at the same time. So at this point I'm going to turn the floor over to Amani who's going to talk about why the retina, the studies that we've been doing, and what we've learned. Thank you so much, Sandy. This is really a beautiful presentation. I learn a lot. Every time I talk to you, I learn a lot about Alzheimer's and uh, why we need biomarkers and, you know, how to make the diagnosis even easier for, for, uh, for patients and for providers. Um, so I think I'm waiting for you to unshare. Super. And so, um, so I think it was five years ago that um, I, I initially started working with mice, uh, with mice models, but, uh, but uh, quickly realized that mice are not people and that uh, we really need to work uh, on imaging patients and understanding what is going on in, in, in Alzheimer's in patients. And that's when I reached out to you and, and that was about five years of collaboration, very productive and, and really enjoyable. And so why, why the retina? And, and I'm glad that Sandy introduced this concept of preclinical and pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's because once uh, patients develop this cognitive decline, it's probably too late to intervene and the focus is now on finding early and earlier bar markers and looking at people with high-risk characteristics who are at high risk for progression and targeting those either for imaging or for treatments that are coming out rather than applying it to people who are already cognitively declined or applying it to people where we're not sure how, how likely they are to develop Alzheimer's uh, dementia. So it's been very tricky to recruit these populations and, and involve them in our studies, but we've really focused on people with pre pre-symptomatic, high-risk characteristics, so mainly amnestic MCI and people with perhaps early Alzheimer's for our studies. And as, as Sandy said, um, a lot of us in, in listening to this talk are asymptomatic and have uh, amyloid beta in our brains. And it's very hard to really tease out these population that is going on to Alzheimer's. And that's where uh, biomarkers are important. And that's where I think uh, the retina is going to be very, very important. So unlike the brain, that's the brain is surrounded by the skull, which is uh, impenetrable to uh, all of our optical imaging devices. The, the eye, the front of the eye is optically clear. We can dilate the pupil and have a really beautiful access to the retina. And so, uh, as, as Sandy said, you know, the ultimate diagnosis is only done at autopsy where you could see these tangles and, and amyloid plaques in the brain. And so the, the stimulus has been to identify sort of biomarkers in, in living people in vivo. And so when I read more about the amyloid PET scans, I learned that they take a lot of time. It's at least 30, 30 minutes sort of uh, waiting for the dye to take in. You inject the dye and then the patient gets the PET scan and then you wait for, for, the, for the images to process and then you need a very certified reliable reader for these scans to be able to tell if it's a positive or a negative scan. As you can see, it's a very global metric and you're looking for the white lesions and the specific areas of the brain that are supposed to ha have amyloid in Alzheimer's. So it's a very labor intense, time intense, invasive test. And then of course, you have the alternative of CSF amyloid, which is a very invasive test. I'm excited to hear more about the plasma test, but basically it's a very involved process, requires time and effort and may be invasive. Compare that to retinal images, and as, as you can see, you could dilate the pupil and have a beautiful image of the retina, but we also have these very uh, 
uh, sort of uh, elegant studies to look at the retina in more detail. So if we wanted to look at the inner retina where the nerve fibers uh, traverse the retina into the optic nerve, we can basically scan a circle around the optic nerve and be able to measure the individual nerve fibers exiting the retina and going to the brain. And those of you who work in MS or in other neurodegenerative diseases know the importance of these metrics for, uh, uh, for basically measuring the nerve fiber layer function around the retina. These optical coherence tomography images have a, uh, have a depth resolution of about 10 microns. So you can imagine how detailed and, and accurate these can be. If we want to look at the retina with even higher detail, we have a technology that we borrowed from space imaging uh, called adaptive optics ophthalmoscopy. And here we could really use a very uh, sort of powerful microscope to zoom in on the retina and we can see the individual photoreceptor cells. So each one of these white dots is an individual photoreceptor in the retina. And so we've used this technology now to look at the inner retina, which is sort of where our interest lies in Alzheimer's disease. And we've been able to visualize gliosis in the inner retina in these patients, as I'll tell you later. And then if we were interested in the vasculature, we, we recently had an adaptation of optical coherence tomography, a software adaptation that basically turns uh, OCT into a vascular capillary imaging device without dye, without time. It takes three seconds to acquire these images and we can look at the retinal capillaries in much greater detail than we've ever been, had before. And so I'll tell you about all these technologies today. But why do we need to look at the retina? I mean, do we have any evidence from previous studies? So back in the 80s and 90s, uh, work was done at USC, where I came from, by David Hinton, who's an, oh, who's an ophthalmic researcher, and Janet Blanks. And they've shown that patients with Alzheimer's, documented Alzheimer's at autopsy, have um, basically inner retinal degeneration. So they've lost neurons, they've lost ganglion cells, and even though they didn't know much about their visual function at the time, uh, this basically gave an indication that Alzheimer's does affect the inner retina. And in these studies, they also looked at gliosis and histopathologically, there's inner retinal gliosis in the retina in patients with Alzheimer's. More recently, it wasn't until 2017 that the group at Cedars-Sinai showed inner retinal plaques in patients who had autopsy evidence of Alzheimer's. So this was the first documented uh, evidence of amyloid plaques in the retina in, in Alzheimer's patients. And then for vascular alterations, we really can't do these at autopsy, but using um, basically uh, in vivo imaging, there's a lot of evidence of, of, of vascular alterations in the retina. So if we look at in vivo studies, um, later on in the 90s and the early 2000s, people looked at the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer with OCT and Alzheimer's and showed that they were decreased. So that was sort of color corollary to the histopathologic uh, evidence from the 80s. And then the group um, in Cedars also done, have done some uh, curcumin labeled uh, imaging of the retina to show that perhaps there's also plaque deposition in the retina in vivo that we can see. However, this work has not yet been validated by other groups. So I'm waiting to see sort of uh, more and more uh, studies to show that we can label the amyloid in the retina in vivo. And finally, for vascular alterations, like I said, in vivo imaging with OCT angiography with Doppler OCT over the years have really showed that the inner retina has decreased blood flow in patients with Alzheimer's. But as I told you, Alzheimer's is, is, is a tad too late to be looking for biomarkers. So what about the pre-symptomatic population? And so there's a lot of uh, nomenclature here and I hope I don't botch it, but basically if you have um, early sort of uh, cognitive, mild cognitive impairment and you have amyloid plaque evidence from uh, biomarkers like PET, then you're called preclinical Alzheimer's. You're not cognitively impaired yet, but you have uh, biomarkers and you have some symptomatic uh, signs that say you might have Alzheimer's. So this is sort of the definition of preclinical Alzheimer's. Amnestic myocognitive impairment is the type of cognitive impairment where amnesia or memory loss is the main uh, main element and these subjects have been shown to be more likely to progress on to Alzheimer's 
uh, I think the number is 40% over three years. So that's sort of the population that we've targeted in our studies. We have not had access to preclinical Alzheimer's yet, but we've looked at amnestic mild cognitive impairment. And then those of um, people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's who have very low cognitive impairment, so not, not advanced Alzheimer's. So in this population, this is now where active research is going on in, in multiple labs. So our first study with, uh, with Sandy was using sort of the easiest target, which is the retinal nerve fiber layer with OCT. And here, our, our study was very, very uh, paradoxical, I would say. So whereas uh, some people have shown that the retinal nerve fiber layer is already decreased in, in these presymptomatic populations, others have shown that they are no different than normals. Our study showed that they were actually thicker than normal. So that was sort of a first kind of controversial thing that we found. But we used that to sort of go on to the next phase. And we hypothesized that this thickening that we found was basically a sign of gliosis. So if you catch these patients really early, it, before the thinning sets in with the cognitive decline, there's actually a, probably an increased activation of the inner retinal gliosis that's going on. And I'll show you later that we've shown that to be true. There hasn't been any studies looking at amyloid deposition, at least in vivo, that I know of in this presymptomatic population. And so hopefully that will happen in the future. And then, uh, as I said, I'll tell you about the gliosis a little bit later. And then I'll start with talking about the vascular alterations. So I will told you already about OCT. And here we use this uh, optical coherence tomograph, uh, sort of like a ultrasound of the eye, but with light. And so we can make optical slices in the retina. And we, if we take a dense volume in the macula, we can basically image the entire macula and project that on FOSS and see the entire uh, retinal structure. So this OCT angiography uh, advance has basically used a very clever trick. You scan each location twice, separated by three milliseconds in time, and then you subtract those two images from each other at each location. And the difference is anything that's moving. So everything that's static is removed from those two images. And the difference of three milliseconds allows you to see the moving structures. And everything that's moving is basically blood flow. So with that technology, we're now able to see the capillaries in the inner retina in much greater detail without dye, without um, using extra time. And so here's sort of a, a cartoon of how that works. You take two images separated by time. You subtract out everything that's not moving, and you highlight whatever's moving, and you suddenly see the capillaries. And if you overlay the capillaries onto the retinal structure, you could see sort of the beautiful trilaminar structure of the capillaries in the inner retina. And so for our studies in Alzheimer's disease, we've really focused on the inner retinal capillaries because that's where the nerve fiber layer runs, that's where the inner retinal ganglion cells run, and that's where the brunt of the pathology has been. But you can also focus on the outer retina and see the outer retinal capillaries. But that's sort of uh, um, not, not very useful in this uh, population. So we focused, like I said, on the amnestic MCI and the early Alzheimer's. We age, race, and gender matched them to controls. We did this imaging in the macula and also around the optic nerve. And so with that, uh, basically, we found that the, that the early presymptomatic Alzheimer's these, uh, eyes had decreased vessels in the macula and in the optic nerve, and that this decrease in vasculature was also correlated with their cognitive score. So that was our first foray into this um, pre presymptomatic Alzheimer's and finding um, sort of correlations. And that was a very exciting study, and I think it got a lot of press at the time. So next we wanted to follow up on this question of gliosis. So we know that the neurons respond by, uh, to any injury by gliosis. So other people have already sort of shown that the inner retina has this sort of deposition of membranes and abnormal structures that can be seen in a variety of diseases. So here we wanted to focus on, the, uh, on this presymptomatic group and we imaged the subjects with, uh, with uh, sort of mild cognitive impairment again. So what is adaptive optics? 
So if you're familiar with the Keck telescope, uh, it's basically based on adaptive optics. And the main technological trick in this device is something called a deformable mirror. So these large giant deformable mirrors basically correct the aberrations in the atmosphere. And so instead of a blur that uh, you see here, once you turn on the adaptive optics, it focuses down on these um, and this, uh, space structures and you can see beautiful, beautiful details. So in the clinic, we have this. And, and so instead of atmospheric aberrations, we have in the eye, we have uh, corneal and lens aberrations that basically deform the wavefront coming out of the eye. So with these deformable mirrors, we correct for these. You, you measure the aberrations coming up out of the eye, the mirrors deform to correct for them, and then you focus the light really sharply and you can have much higher resolution than before. And so instead of a, a giant Keck telescope, it's sort of a giant, but not so giant instrument we have in the clinic. And you can compare the size wise to, to an, an OCT angiogram, which is sort of a very elegant and well wrapped up machine. This one's maybe four times as big, but it's still, it's still, uh, it's not the Keck telescope quite. But the images we get out of that can be very beautiful. So if you have one of those, in a um, prototype fashion, really well designed and sort of adapted with uh, OCT like this group here in Indiana, you could see the individual nerve bundles, you can see the individual cell uh, bodies of the ganglion cells as you scan through the retina in beautiful detail. But that requires five times as big an instrument which we can't uh, physically afford in our clinic. But these, these can give you really beautiful details of the retina. But the one we have is, is perhaps less powerful, but very, very productive. So we recruited the same type of population, the pre-symptomatic, and we performed the adaptive optics imaging on them. And we, again, age matched them uh, to the controls from, from the ADRC. So these were cognitively tested. The controls were actually confirmed to be cognitively healthy. And then if you look at a normal eye, this is uh, what you see here are the actual nerve bundles of the nerve fiber layer. We could see individual bundles coursing on top of the retinal vasculature in the inner retina, which is amazing detail. And then uh, we had um, masked observers basically grade these inner retinal uh, images. So to, to identify structures and they were all masked to the identity of the patients. And they looked at size, location and, and uh, type of membranes. And so this is the membrane we found in our uh, Alzheimer's and pre-symptomatic population. And we basically, uh, had, it had not been described before, so we had to name it. We called it granular membrane. As you can see here, it's a giant uh, structure that basically lies on top of the vessels and the nerve fiber layer. And we postulate that these are the activated micro and macroglia and astrocytes basically getting activated and, and, um, uh, and basically turning into a conglomerate of membranes on top of the retina. And we found that these large membranes were, were basically large and, and they were easily found around the optic nerve in these subjects. So um, if you try to see these membranes on uh, OCT, the technology that we have uh, routinely in the clinic, you can't see them. They basically are very subtle, they're very hard to see. And so basically with adaptive optics, we were able to see something that was, would probably be invisible to other technologies. As you could see here from the yellow arrows, there's a hint of something there, but it's not, not quite as uh, dramatic as with the adaptive optics. We also found other structures that they were less impressive and not as well associated with uh, our uh, Alzheimer's population. So if we look at the data now, uh, of course we do the OCTs to sort of as a quality control, as a sort of a sanity uh, check. And here, as, as we predicted, the uh, inner retinal thickness, the nerve fiber layer thickness was no different. So we didn't find the thickening that we found in the earlier study, but we definitely did not find a difference between the controls and the presymptomatic population. So you can't just use OCT to detect this uh, preclinical state. 
However, when we looked at these granular membranes, we found uh, more membranes and larger area occupied by membranes in our uh, uh, preclinical, presymptomatic population. And the effect size was large. So when we looked at a biomarker that we could use uh, going forward, this would probably be the most powerful. Uh, the only problem is it's probably not available to everyone in the community. It would have to be in specialized centers that have it. So it's not a sort of a mass produced type uh, imaging device. So uh, we're still sort of thinking about other ways to kind of uh, uh, apply this in, in mass. The other interesting thing that was that the size and the area of the membranes was also associated with the cognitive scores, the uh, MOCA scores. Uh, so that was another sanity check that these membranes are really telling us something about the cognitive impairment in these subjects. So with that, I'll basically summarize. So overall, we found that these membranes were uh, present mostly in the cognitively impaired population. They were larger and they were more associated with our cognitive impairment. Uh, they're lying on top of the nerve fiber layer and we postulate that these are masking the underlying uh, RNF or retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. And I think that's why when we do OCT, we cannot pick out these subjects early on because these membranes are going on top of the nerve fiber layer, making it artifactually thicker. So we can't detect that mild thinning in the inner retina. When we looked at the vasculature, we found that the capillaries in the inner retina were decreased in this presymptomatic population and that that, that decrease in flow was also associated with their cognitive impairment, another sanity check. And this difference was found in the optic nerve, around the optic nerve and in the parafovia. So with that, I want to sort of look in the future and see what we need to do next. So before COVID struck, we were gearing up to do the study that I really would like to do, which is compare our imaging findings to the PET scan images and the sort of uh, synchronon uh, uh, biomarker for amyloid. So we're hoping to start recruiting whenever it's feasible to try to image people with known biomarker positivity in the brain and to see what, if we can find strong correlations in the retina. And hopefully the retina can sort of become part of that um, sort of algorithm for early detection, whether it's the gliosis or the vasculature, um, sort of as a, as, a, as a sort of a secondary or tertiary confirming evidence of, of the state of uh, preclinical Alzheimer's. And with that, I'd like to thank the lab and, and people who've worked on this project and specifically Stephanie, who is a medical student. And this, uh, those two papers are actually her, uh, part of her AOSC project, which has been uh, super, uh, super productive. And the other members of the lab who took the images and helped us with this. And of course, Sandy, who's been a great collaborator and uh, really learned a lot from working with her on this project. Hopefully we can take it further and do the definitive study soon. Thank you. And I think we're open for questions now. Do you, um, do you see the questions that have popped up? Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. I see. I think the first two questions are for Sandy. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so uh, they are both actually really good questions. Um, I think the third one is too, but it's <laughs> yeah. all good questions. Great questions. Um, can dementia increase susceptibility to conspiracy theories? It would appear to be so due to changes in reasoning, judgment, and personality. So the thing about dementia is that it represents a change, not necessarily a characteristic that you're born with. So lots of people are born with poor judgment, poor behavior, social disinhibition, but that's the way they were born. So that's not necessarily dementia. Those characteristics probably are related in some way to believing in conspiracy theories or lots of other things but uh, it's not really uh, has to do with dementia. The second question, it's a very good question. For those of us in primary care, can you differentiate mild cognitive impairment from pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease? How is this distinction clinically useful? 
So I want to make the point clear that pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease is a point in time where there are no symptoms, no clinical symptoms, but you're biomarker positive. So pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease is only defined on the basis of biomarker positivity without cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment is already into the symptomatic phase. And you may have positive, uh, in fact, in our clinic, we might diagnose somebody with mild cognitive impairment because they're functioning normally, but on their neuropsychological examination, their scores on tests of memory are below normal for their age. So that would be consistent with a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. And then if we sent that person for CSF, which sometimes we do, um, and it's positive for uh, Alzheimer biomarkers, then we would say this is mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. Does that answer? I hope that answered the question. Um, are there any genetic markers that tend to be associated with early developing amyloid or tau growth? So most of Alzheimer's disease is what's called sporadic Alzheimer's disease, however, there are certain forms of Alzheimer's disease that are autosomally dominant inheritance pattern diseases. Um, presenolin-1 uh, mutation, presenolin-2, and amyloid precursor protein. However, in those individuals, very clear that there is a strong family history, one generation to the next, um, and the onset typically is in the 40s. So uh, that is one form of Alzheimer's. For the sporadic Alzheimer's, however, we do know that there are genetic risk factors. So apolipoprotein E, which is a membrane protein, has uh, the gene for apolipoprotein E. There are three varieties, E2, E3, and E4. And there have been many studies now that have shown that people who possess one, at least one E4 allele from a parent are at higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease in the brain and dementia. But it's not predictive because a lot of people who have an E4 never develop it. The other thing we learned in our research here at Northwestern is that depending on the clinical presentation of the Alzheimer's, so we have patients who had mm -hmm. primary progressive aphasia during lifetime and Alzheimer's disease as post-mortem, those individuals do not have the same genetic risk with the A4 allele as those who have memory loss. So again, a pretty complicated story, but I hope that um, that answered your question. So I think the next one is for me. Does tau protein also present in the presymptomatic retina and can that be useful as a retinal biomarker? I'm not aware of any studies of, of tau in the retina, but um, not in the human retina. There's some studies in the mouse retina and I'm not really sure what that means, but I'm not aware. One of the other things we were hoping also to do is, is, uh, is to start looking. I think there's, um, there's, the, there's a new pathologist, uh, and Sandy, you can update us on the status. We're hoping to start looking at autopsy eyes as well to try to uh, correlate some of these findings in vivo to autopsy eyes in, in, in the Alzheimer's populations of Northwestern. Yeah, the, the thing about tau, though, is that unlike amyloid, it seems to be a later uh, occurrence because tau is a marker of neuronal degeneration. So it is far later in the course of the cascade than the amyloid changes. So we might not find uh, mm -hmm. tau, especially in earlier stages. So uh, Dr. Z asked uh, if, uh, if uh, the granular membranes are present in other neurodegenerative disorders. I think that's something that we could potentially look at. We have not recruited uh, patients with Parkinson's and um, there's definitely potential for these membranes to be there in other diseases, but we haven't looked. So that would be a, an interesting other collaboration. Um, I'm happy to, to talk to you more about that. Um, this, do we have any more time for questions? Yes. Uh, with respect to other biomarkers, is there any work progressing on the use of quantitative EEG? Quantitative EEG, I'm not an expert in it, but it's kind of... Um, grosser measure than the kinds of things that we're talking about. By the time that you have changes in quantitative EEG, it's more likely that you are actually going to be symptomatic. So I don't really know, um, I don't know if anybody else who's 
watching this knows whether quantitative EEG has been used in a predictive manner. There's an FDG pet question to you, Sandy. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um. Changes. So changes in FDG pet results side, the earliest onset, does that suggest that energy metabolism of neurons or glia may be a leading cause of pathology? Yeah, so um, definitely there are changes in synaptic uh, connections that might be being picked up by FDG PET. And it's actually not that early. The ear really earliest thing is the uh, increase in the amyloid. But really by the time you start getting FDG PET abnormalities, you're into uh, symptomatic. And it's, I, you know, I don't really know that much about the energy metabolism of neurons, um, but I know that we, don't really have a great understanding of what causes that pathology. There are a lot of theories like uh, Mesulam has suggested that uh, the plaques and tangles are a downstream creation of plasticity failure. And mm -hmm. that reason that Alzheimer's starts in the medial temporal lobe is that that's probably the part of the brain that's just working overtime because it has to record everything in your life's experience. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the brain cells that don't really reinvent themselves wear out and it's the wear and tear that kicks off the cascade that then leads to amyloid. But that's hypothetical. Mm -hmm. What is the value of elderly patients with cognitive decline to undergo brain autopsies? Does this help only if there are early changes or can be helpful if there is severe? Mm -hmm. So excellent question. Um, in our Alzheimer's cent uh, Center, we have uh, Maggie Flanagan is the director of our neuropathology core. And uh, as part of our commitment, our research participants mm -hmm. commit to brain donation at the time of death. This is critical because that's the only way we're going to understand how, what the relationship is between the cognitive symptoms and what's actually in the brain. And the brain donations are accepted from all of our research participants, cognitively healthy, as well as cognitively impaired. Um, the problem, uh, a lot of times people will try to call and donate a brain from somebody who has not been followed in research and who has died and has been given a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And those brains are not useful to us. There are other repositories uh, that you can look up through the NIH that will accept those kinds of brain donations. But for us, what's most important is knowing what a person was like during their lifetime and then seeing the brain. Have we looked at the retina and superagers? I think that was one of the projects we talked about, uh, but we've uh, we've not taken it up yet. I think it would be great to to um, to do it. Yeah, that's something we talked about a few, yeah, uh, a few for years those ago. Superagers are a group of people we're following here at Northwestern who do not have memory problems, and they're over age 80. And when our oldest participant is 104, and her memory is better than mine. <laughs> um, and uh, we're really trying to understand not only the bad side of aging, but what can protect you from that. Right, and then the question about astrocyte change in the retina uh, with a preclinical symptom as an early biomarker. Is it possible? So, you know, we're not sure what cells are activated and what these membranes are actually uh, made of. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're hoping to start uh, looking at, um, at donor eyes as well. Um, it's potentially the astrocytes that are activated and turning into these membranes, but also it could be microglia, it could be uh, other cells, it could be the Miller cells of the inner retina, which is a macroglia of the retina. So um, I, I don't know, and until we basically have uh, donor eyes to do the correlations, I'm not sure which cell is, is doing this, but that's a great question. Great reason to have the autopsy eyes. I think we have reached one o'clock. Manjo? What happens now? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I think, well, I mean, I think, I think all of our questions have been answered. Um, or if there are, are there any outstanding questions? There, there were a couple of more questions, but we don't have time at the moment. Yeah, so okay. um, 
I think the best thing to do at this point is we will just thank everybody for attending. We have recorded the webinar. I will be posting it on um, the IFAM website and on YouTube, and I'll send it out to everybody who registered to attend. And I think if anybody has any further follow-up questions for either Sandra or Amani, they can maybe reach out by email. I think that's probably the best. And again, I just, on behalf of the Medical Faculty Council, want to really thank you, Sandy and Imani, really for an outstanding lecture. Thank you. Um, it was fantastic. So thank, thank you, you so much, Maya. Thank you. And Joe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.